In the last few talks, we've been really focusing on how ultrasound interacts with matter. Now we're going to focus on our last type of tissue interaction, and that is scatter. We're also going to look at the concept of attenuation, the loss of ultrasound intensity as it travels through tissue. Now, a lot of people get confused here. What we're losing as ultrasound travels through tissue is intensity. We're losing the amplitude of our waves. We are not losing speed or decreasing wavelength or decreasing our frequencies. Those are ultrasound and tissue dependent. What changes is we lose intensity. So let's start by having a look at scatter. Now, what exactly is scatter? And I've mentioned it once or twice in the previous couple of talks that when a wave comes into contact with an object or a unit in that medium that is smaller than its wavelength, we can get what is known as scatter. So if we have an ultrasound wave traveling through a medium that doesn't have small units in that medium, it will travel through unaffected. As soon as there are smaller units within the medium that are smaller than the wavelength of the incident ultrasound beam itself, we get what is known as scatter. The vast majority of that wave will pass through these regions unaffected, but those small regions of the waves that come into contact with these small units will let off small ultrasound waves in all different directions, in 360 degrees, losing some of that beam's intensity. This is a contributor to attenuation of the ultrasound beam. Now, the more dense those small units are packed within that tissue, the more scatter we will get. The higher the acoustic impedance of those small units that cause scatter, the more scatter we will get. And the wider the radius of those units, the more scatter we will get, as long as those units remain shorter than a wavelength within the incident ultrasound beam. And if we were to change the frequency of our incident ultrasound beam, the higher the frequency, the more chance it is to come into contact with these small units within a tissue, the more scatter we will get within a tissue. Now, scatter is what's largely contributing to a tissue's echogenicity. Now, when we looked at x-rays, we didn't want scatter. Scatter provided no value. The same isn't the case in ultrasound. Scatter actually provides us some value. When an ultrasound beam travels through a particular tissue, let's say the kidney, there will be a certain type of scatter pattern. The smallest functional units within the kidneys will result in a specific amount of scatter. And that scatter heading back towards our ultrasound transducer will provide some signal. It's noisy, it's disorganized, and it doesn't perfectly correlate with the anatomy like our large specular reflectors did, but it does provide us some signal, and that signal is what is known as the echo texture of that specific organ. Now, if you look at these red scatters coming away from our incident ultrasound beam, obviously not many of them will come directly back to where that ultrasound beam was coming from. Only very few of them will go back towards our specific region on the transducer. But our transducer is wide in itself, and some of these will hit other parts of our transducer, giving back signal when the transducer is listening for those returning echoes. So we are getting scatter signal from a wide area, all heading back in an unorganized manner towards our transducer. And that is going to provide what is known as the echo texture of the organ that we are imaging. Now, the more scatter there is, we might call that hyperechoic. It's got more echoes coming back than the baseline tissue. The less scatter involved, we call it hypoechoic or even anechoic if there's no scatter happening, where we get no signal coming back towards our tissue. So scatter is one of the mechanisms for beam attenuation. We are losing some intensity as some of this energy is dissipated out into the tissues. Now, I said when we've got a wave going over pebbles, it's a really good way to think about it. A large wave with a large wavelength coming into interactions with small little pebbles. We can see how that energy is spread out in all different directions. The wave will pass over the pebbles easily, but there is some loss in intensity. Now, the second way we can lose intensity is through heat generation in a tissue, when a tissue absorbs some of that energy in the form of heat. And some people count reflection as the third mechanism of attenuation. Strictly speaking, it's not attenuation. We haven't lost energy at a tissue boundary. We've just separated that energy. Some of it is a reflection, some of it is transmitted through. Now, the largest contributor to attenuation is the loss of ultrasound energy as heat within a tissue. So if we were to look at attenuation, we can see that it is dependent on multiple factors.
Here we've got a low frequency beam heading into tissue. It loses intensity as it travels a certain depth. So the first thing we note is that attenuation is dependent on depth traveled through a tissue. We lose energy as we travel through depth. The second we can see is as we've got a higher frequency ultrasound beam here, we travel a shorter distance and lose the same amount of intensity. Attenuation is dependent also on frequency. The higher the frequency, the more attenuation that happens. This wave is coming into contact with the tissue more often. It's a good way of thinking about it. We cross this line more quickly than we cross the line in a lower frequency ultrasound pulse. Now another way to think about this is if your neighbors are having a party and there's music playing at night, what is the sound that you hear? You hear that low bass, mm, 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 the low frequency sounds. That's because low frequency sounds aren't attenuated as quickly. They travel through the walls. They aren't attenuated by the walls as much as our high frequency sounds. So we can't hear the lyrics of that music, but we can hear the bass, the low frequency sounds. So attenuation is dependent on the frequency of our incident wave, the depth it's traveling through, and it's dependent on the tissue that it is going through. Tissues attenuate ultrasound beams differently, and they have a specific attenuation coefficient attached to the specific tissues, which we're going to look at now. Now I've said and I've highlighted that attenuation is a loss in intensity, not a loss in speed, wavelength, or frequency. And we looked at this when we had a whole lecture looking at intensities, and we looked at the loss of intensity using the decibel scale, a relative intensity loss, comparing one intensity to another intensity. And I just want to remind you here that a loss of three decibels corresponds to a halving in intensity, and a gain of three decibels, a doubling of intensity. And for every 10 decibels, we get a tenfold increase or decrease in intensity because of this base 10 log scale here. It's an exponential change. This is not a linear scale. The decibel scale is a logarithmic scale. So let's have a look at attenuation within a specific tissue. Here is our relative intensity. So we are representing a loss in intensity on this y-axis. Here is the depth going through tissue, and each one of these lines represents a different frequency of our ultrasound probe. And this graph is for a specific tissue. So frequency changes attenuation, the depth in which we go through a tissue changes attenuation, and the tissue type changes attenuation. Now I don't want you to learn this formula, but we can see if we take our incident intensity and we plug it into this formula using our attenuation coefficient that is specific for that tissue at a specific frequency, and the distance that that incident ultrasound beam is traveling, we can calculate the change in intensity, our resultant intensity. Now you might recognize this formula if you've done the X-ray physics module when we looked at the linear attenuation coefficient. Now these vary subtly, and that's why I don't actually want you to learn this equation. And the biggest difference is that in linear attenuation coefficient, as our frequency of that wave increased, the energy of our X-ray increased, the more penetration, the less attenuation we got. Here, the higher our frequency of the ultrasound wave, the more attenuation we get. So attenuation is now proportional to frequency. We know that as frequency increases, think about it as interacting with the tissue, more tissue interactions per given period of time. So if we were to look at various different tissues, we can see that the attenuation coefficient of those tissues varies greatly between tissues. Now we are going to largely look at soft tissue. Remember when we looked at speed of ultrasound, we said that we assume speed travels at a set speed through soft tissue, even though we know it changes slightly through the various different tissues. The same happens with attenuation. We are going to approximate this attenuation in soft tissue to be 0.5 decibels per centimeter per megahertz. Now you can see that these values here are for an ultrasound beam that is one megahertz in frequency because we know attenuation is dependent on the frequency and it's per centimeter. Attenuation changes over depth as we're going deeper and deeper into a tissue. Now in our previous talk, we looked at a muscle bone interface and we saw that almost half of that ultrasound pulse was reflected back towards the transducer and just over half actually went into the bone.
And I said to you that the bone attenuates that ultrasound wave very quickly. That's why we don't get any detail beyond the bone. And you can see here that our attenuation coefficient is extremely high. It's roughly 40 times higher than soft tissue. Now a 40 decibel change corresponds to a 10,000 fold intensity change. So our bone here is 10,000 times more attenuating than the soft tissue. So let's look at this graph again, and this graph actually corresponds to attenuation within soft tissue. Now when we looked at this table here, we said that soft tissue we're going to approximate to 0.5 decibels per centimeter. So here in soft tissue, we can multiply our frequency by 0.5 decibels per centimeter per megahertz. So let's take a 2 megahertz ultrasound pulse. We times that 2 megahertz by 0.5, and that gives us 1 decibel per centimeter that this ultrasound beam is being attenuated as it travels through tissue. We take our 4 megahertz beam, times that by 0.5, we get 2 decibels per centimeter as it travels through tissue. Now this is the equation that I want you to learn because this is the one that generally comes up in exams. They ask you to calculate intensity loss as a beam travels through soft tissue. And we can use this equation as a rule of thumb to calculate that attenuation. Another way this question is often asked is by calculating the half value thickness. In x-rays we looked at the half value layer, the thickness of tissue required to attenuate the beam to half its intensity. The same happens here. What thickness of tissue reduces the incident ultrasound beam by 50%? The intensity of that beam by 50%. Now we know when we looked at that decibel scale, halving of our intensity resulted in a 3 decibel loss of intensity. So if we take our 2 megahertz beam and use our equation here, we know that a 2 megahertz beam loses 1 decibel per centimeter that it travels in soft tissue. So it loses 1 decibel over the first centimeter, 2 decibels over the second centimeter, and 3 decibels over 3 centimeters. That results in a halving of the intensity. A 2 megahertz beam gets halved in intensity over 3 centimeters of depth. If we were to take our 4 megahertz ultrasound beam, we know that loses 2 decibels per centimeter that it travels. So it travels 1.5 centimeters before it loses 3 decibels. Our half value thickness in a 4 megahertz beam will be 1.5 centimeters of soft tissue. So how does this actually relate to our ultrasound beam traveling through tissues? Now the point I want to get across here is that intensity loss is logarithmic we are losing a lot of intensity as we travel through tissue over distance, as we increase our frequency of our ultrasound pulse, and as we have more attenuating types of tissues. So let's take an example here and see how much intensity will actually reach our ultrasound probe when we are listening for that echo. Now we create a 4 megahertz ultrasound beam at our ultrasound transducer here and it travels five centimeters in depth to reach this tissue boundary here. So our four megahertz ultrasound beam is traveling five centimeters. Now if we use our equation here, a four megahertz beam loses two decibels per centimeter. So over five centimeters, it's going to lose 10 decibels. And we know that a 10 decibel decrease in ultrasound intensity results in a 10 fold decrease in ultrasound intensity. So this beam has lost 10 times the amount of intensity to reach this surface here. Now that's only half the distance it's traveled. It's now got to travel back to our transducer. So in traveling a further five centimeters, it loses another 10 decibels. In total now, it's lost 20 decibels of intensity. And we can see that a 20 decibel loss in intensity results in a hundred fold decrease in intensity. Now that's not all. That assumes that all of that ultrasound beam was reflected at this surface and there was no transmittance of that ultrasound beam. If this was a fat muscle boundary, we would see that only about 1% of that initial intensity will be reflected back. So no longer do we have a 100-fold decrease. If only 1% of that intensity comes back, we've got a 10,000-fold decrease in ultrasound intensity, a 40-decibel decrease in ultrasound intensity.
And it's this massive decrease in intensity of our echoes, which means our ultrasound machines have to be very good at listening for extremely small echoes coming back. And the range in which the ultrasound can hear those echoes coming back is what is known as our dynamic range, a concept that we're going to expand on in future talks. But you can see these intensities coming back from our close-up structures are going to be exponentially higher than those intensities coming back from our deeper structures. So hopefully that's given you a good idea of how attenuation works in tissues. If there's anything to take away from this, we are losing intensity and nothing else. And this loss in intensity either comes from scattering or it comes from energy loss as heat into our tissues. And various different tissues attenuate ultrasound beams differently. The higher frequency our ultrasound beam, the more attenuation. And attenuation occurs as we travel through a depth in tissue. So now we've looked at how ultrasound interacts with different tissues. And ultrasound interaction with tissues is a core concept, something that comes up over and over again in exams. And if you want to understand how ultrasound works, you have to understand how ultrasound interacts with tissues, especially when we start looking at our artifacts that we see within tissues. They all relate back to these interactions that we've covered in the last four talks. So now we're going to shift our focus to the ultrasound transducer itself. We look at the various different types and how we go about making an ultrasound wave. And again, if you are studying for an ultrasound physics exam or a radiology physics exam, I've linked a question bank that I've curated. It's in the description below. That's a great way to test your knowledge, see where your knowledge gaps are, and then come back to these lectures and fill those gaps. So I'll see you all in our next talk. I hope you've enjoyed this. Goodbye, everybody.